Send your scariest workplace stories to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. And rate and review Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Thanks. A quick update. If you're a fan of my other show, Outdoor Terrors, it is now being hosted by Nature's Temper with a new name, Alone in the Woods. It's also now 60 minutes long per episode, and it's currently holding a contest for scariest true outdoor story. If you're interested, send us your story at eeriecast.com outdoor. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? Government jobs can be dangerous. I mean, can you imagine being one of those new armed IRS agents trying to audit an angry business owner down here in the South? Poor guy might end up with an over-sugared coffee. Speak of the devil, today I've got a load of new scary work stories, and a couple of which feature government jobs going horribly wrong. One from a biologist, and one from a marine. So hold on to your income taxes. These are tales from the break room. Every elder care facility has ghosts. From Bree. I've experienced supernatural happenings in several places of employment over the years. My first job was at a haunted museum, where the founder and his faithful dog were regular visitors to the gallery. But you don't need to spend your days immersed in the artifacts of the past to encounter ghosts and spirits. Few know this more intimately, or more certainly, than those who work in healthcare, particularly those who provide aid to the elderly as they approach the end of their earthly tenure. When I was in my mid-twenties, I worked in dining services at a long-term assisted living facility for several years. The hours were pretty beastly, as breakfast service started at 7 a.m., and we had plenty of early risers, a trait I most decidedly did not share. But the pay was decent, and it came with a free meal on shift, for a 20-something struggling to make ends meet in the middle of the real estate market crash of the early 2000s, it was a godsend. Five to six days a week, I would get up, throw on my polo and khakis, chug down 16 ounces of Wawa's strongest coffee, and head into work with a bottle of energy drink in one apron pocket and a tiny flask of something decidedly stronger in the other. The kitchen staff generally followed a pretty set routine for breakfast shifts. There was no assigned seating, but the residents usually sat in the same places for each meal. Every server had a preferred section of the dining room and would usually stick to it. This made things easier on us and on the residents we waited on, since it allowed us to anticipate their needs and give them a sense of stability in their day-to-day -day lives. This was especially important for residents with memory issues. We had quite a few residents in varying stages of Alzheimer's or dementia, and it helped them to see a familiar face most mornings, especially when that face was attached to someone who greeted them by name and remembered that they liked two eggs over easy, wheat toast with marmalade, and a cup of hot tea on mornings when their own recollection wasn't cooperating. All these years later, I can still remember some of those orders by heart. Pretty quickly, I discovered that I had a knack for both dealing with and disarming all but the most cantankerous of the residents. As anyone who's ever worked with the elderly or had grumpy grandparents will tell you, old folks can get very grouchy, and some of them do not hesitate to take it out on the people around them, especially service staff. Whether they're not feeling well, having a bad week, suffering from depression, or just foul-tempered in general. If you're in their line of sight when something goes wrong, you're likely to get an earful. When I started, we had two tables with a particular reputation for being picky, argumentative, contrary, and just rude in general to the waitstaff. Within six months, I'd managed to make myself the favorite of both tables, to the point that we reordered the section chart so that they were included in my usual section. I find that the trick with any grumpy customer is to acknowledge their complaints, address them as quickly as possible, and try to get them to laugh. It helps to break the tension, and it's hard to stay mad at someone who catches you off guard with a giggle, 
or start singing along with the old-timey tunes on the overhead speaker. Like I said, I'm nothing even resembling a morning person, but a bit of fake it till you make it goes a long way on a breakfast shift, and it's much easier to deal with your tables when everyone is in a good mood. Plus, the smile does become infectious after a while. If ducking into the walk-in for a nip from that little bottle of something stronger helped me shore up my determination once in a while, no one was any the wiser. Inevitably, there would be mornings when one resident or another would be absent from their usual chair in the morning, and we would hear later in the day that they'd been taken to the hospital or that their family had removed them to hospice care. Sometimes, we would be told that they passed away overnight. Whenever this happened, we usually tried to be extra nice to their table mates. It was a toss-up as to whether the residents would be emotional about the passing or completely oblivious to it. But every once in a while, they seemed to know ahead of time that something was about to happen. My second year at the facility, Ellen, one of my regulars, came into the dining room one morning, looking a bit glum. I brought her the usual favorites, cereal with bananas and decaf coffee, and tried to make small talk to help cheer her up. As she was finishing her meal, she sighed and reached over to pat my hand as I cleared away someone else's dishes. I'm gonna miss you, she said with a wistful smile. Miss me? Are you finally moving to that big penthouse in Florida? Gonna light up the Miami party scene and show the young kids how it's done, huh? This had been a running joke with us for many months, since Ellen had lived on the Florida coast in her younger days and had always wanted to move back and be a proper snowbird. She shook her head. I think I'm going away soon. Not to Florida. The man was in my hallway last night. I heard him outside my door, so I guess my time is just about up. The other residents at the table turned solemn. It seemed as if a chill had entered the dining room. I fought down a wave of goosebumps. The man? What man, Ellen? Was somebody bothering you? It wasn't out of the question since some of the residents had been known to leave their rooms, wandering around at night if they got confused or couldn't sleep. But Ellen just shook her head. No, she said. He's just around. I was about to ask for more details, but right at that moment her aide came to take her down to morning bingo, and another of my tables began to fill up. So I forgot about the whole thing, until I was in the break room having my own breakfast. I mentioned the incident to one of my senior co-workers. She got a weird look on her face. Ah, oh, yeah, that's a thing, she told me. Sometimes the residents say they saw a man in the hall late at night or hear him walking around. It's never anyone they actually know, and apparently it's never a staff member. They won't say what he looks like. He's just the man. But every time someone says they see him or hear him outside the door, they usually pass away within a week. I almost choked on my bagel. <laughs> Seriously? This place has a ghost story and you didn't tell me? Honey, every place like this has ghost stories by the bucket load. We just don't talk about them much. Too depressing. Plus, it makes the residents nervous and scares the new hires. There was an overnight aide a couple years back who said she saw someone in the hall late one night. But when she went to see if they needed help, there was no one there. Unable to restrain my skepticism, I asked... And did she die afterward? Not that we know of, but she did quit the next day, and she never came back. I wasn't sure what to believe, so I continued on with my day. Ellen was back for supper that night, and when she asked me to sing that funny four-leaf clover song while I cleared the table, well, who was I to say no? I had the next couple of days off, so I wasn't aware of anything going on at work till I got back. Sure enough, Ellen had passed away the day after she told me about hearing the man outside her door. From what I heard, she lay down for a nap after lunch, and when the aide went to fetch her for dinner, 
she was already gone. For what it's worth, she was a sweet old gal, and I hope there's a Miami penthouse in whatever afterlife she went to. That was my first encounter with the supernatural in that place, but it was far from the last. I learned to take sightings of the man seriously, and even took to letting the nurses and aides know if someone mentioned something during mealtime gossip. On more than one occasion, another resident that I heard mention hearing or seeing the man would pass away soon after. I don't know if all end-of-life care facilities have their own resident death ohm inspector, but that one certainly did. Thankfully, I never saw or heard him myself. As creepy as the man was, there was also more poignant moments, where death came not as ominous footsteps in the night, but as the face of an old friend. Many aides told stories of residents who would talk about seeing their parents or siblings or deceased spouses in the days before their passing. It was such a common occurrence that the on-site medical staff took to marking it in file notes, taking it as a sign to contact family members if they weren't already on standby. One particularly heart-wrenching episode involved a man with advanced dementia, whose wife had passed some weeks prior, and he just couldn't remember that she was gone. That would have been hard enough on its own, but the family had decided not to tell him, and had forbidden the staff to do so. Even though I could understand the concern for his health and his already fragile mental state, it still felt cruel to leave him confused and wondering. She had been his rock, his touchstone, his whole world, and he couldn't understand why she wasn't there. Every day he'd ask when she was getting back from the hospital, and I would have to smile and take his order and hold back my tears until I was sitting behind the wheel of my ancient, uncooperative sedan after my shift. Fifteen days after his wife's passing, the staff found him out of his wheelchair, stretched full length on the floor of his room. He wasn't badly hurt, just some bumps and bruises, but they took him to the hospital anyway. When asked what had happened, he said very simply, I was reaching for her. We all exchanged grim looks of understanding in the kitchen, passing a flask around. A few days later, he was gone and we passed the flask again, knowing his darling wife had been there to show him the way. Despite being surrounded by these otherworldly happenings and experiencing them second or third hand through residents and co-workers, there's only one event that I can point to that happened solely to me. And much like the other brushes with the supernatural I've had on the job, it was much more unnerving than frightening but it left me shaken for a good week afterward. It was a pretty ordinary day, one of those winter mornings where the sun is even more reluctant to get up than a breakfast shift waitress, and everything stays cold and dark well after you'd think the sky ought to be brightening. On such mornings, the residents tended to sleep late, but we few, we sorry few, in this case the band of waitstaff, had no such option. So there I was, two cups of coffee deep, puttering around my section of the dining room, when Morris came around the corner. Morris was one of my regulars, a hale and hearty fellow despite being in his 80s, and generally very pleasant to be around. He liked detective movies and big band music, and a steaming cup of coffee before a bowl of raisin bran with bananas. Like me, he tended to move through his morning routine on autopilot, and wouldn't be properly awake until the caffeine finally hit. I gave him a little wave as he shuffled toward his usual table and turned to get the carafe. Morning, Morris. One java, two sugars coming up. You want your usual today or are we switching things up? There was no immediate answer, but that didn't surprise me. Morris was a little hard of hearing, and sometimes he forgot to put his hearing aids in first thing in the morning. I was used to repeating myself, or making sure he could see my face when I spoke. I turned around, pitcher in hand, only to be greeted by an empty dining room. No Morris. His chair was still pushed in and the coffee cup was still upside down on its saucer. 
but I had seen him come in. I had heard the sound of his feet on the floor and the rustle of clothing and the familiar sound of breath whistling through a nose that always accompanied him. But he was not in the dining room, and I didn't see him when I stuck my head out into the hallway. Another resident came in a moment later, so I shrugged it off and went on with my morning. Maybe Morris had gone into the sitting room or down to the nurse's station. Maybe he had an early appointment and was headed for the lobby to meet his ride. Not really my business, but I made a mental note to check on him later. As it turned out, I wouldn't see Morris the rest of that day. Or ever again. As I was clearing away the lunch dishes, I asked the nurse who usually attended to his wing how Morris was doing, since I hadn't seen him since breakfast. She gave me an odd look. Honey, Morris didn't come to breakfast today. Oh, I know, I prattled on. He came in for a second, but he didn't sit down or ask for his coffee. Guess he had an appointment. No, honey, Morris... Morris passed away last night. The funeral home came to pick him up right after breakfast started. I just about dropped the stack of plates I was putting onto the serving cart. My whole body went cold in a way that had nothing to do with the dreary day outside, and a little pang went through me. Morris was one of my favorite people to wait on, and I was going to miss him. Still, I couldn't help but wonder if his spirit had continued that morning routine on autopilot, heading down to the dining room for a bowl of cereal and his morning cup of joe. I just hoped they served good coffee at his wake. North Pole Nightmare From Lord of PTT The story I'm going to tell you happened to me ten years ago and it changed my life forever. I'm a retired marine biologist. I retired about 10 years ago, in fact, and that's about when this story was happening. You see, as a marine biologist, you first need to pass standard army education and camps, and then, if you're good enough to be chosen, you can pick what you want to specialize in. I liked nature. I would often go mountain climbing, exploring forests, photographing wildlife, and so on. So, when I got the chance to choose my field of work, I chose to be a marine biologist. Over the years, I visited a lot of countries and researched their ecosystems. My team consisted of four people. Me, of course, my best friend John, and two close friends Michael and Gabe. Throughout the years, we've been on a lot of missions and grew really close. But everything changed on what would be our last mission. We were going to the North Pole. Until that point, the hardest mission we'd been on was in the Amazon forest. We were taking some samples from the forest, and we needed to stay for a couple of days, and I can say with all honesty it was a very unpleasant experience. The rain almost never stops, so you're wet 99% of the time. The bugs crawl all over you and you're constantly surrounded by predators. But that mission, no matter how hard it was, could not prepare me for what would happen at the North Pole. One day we came into the conference room for a meeting. Our boss debriefed us, saying we'd be heading to the North Pole soon, taking samples of ice for a study related to climate change. Ah, interesting, I said to myself. Never been to the North Pole. Never thought I'd go. Our boss told us we would be staying there for about three weeks. We would be located at some military base. You can work in peace there. There's no one there at this time of year, he added. After our duties were explained, Michael, Gabe, John, and I went for lunch, discussing the things and equipment we needed to take for the mission. A few days later, we said goodbye to our families and off we were to the North Pole. I can tell you that the person who left for the North Pole that day isn't the same person who returned home from there. Things weren't going right, right from the start. The original plan was that the helicopter that would fly us there would leave us next to the military base, but as we came closer to the base, a nasty storm started to form. Our pilot told us that he would need to leave us further from the base. 
Just our luck, I jokingly said to my group. Man, I hate the cold, Gabe said. Stop complaining, Gabe, you chose this job, John added. After we landed and took our stuff and equipment, we decided to make shelter. We would just have to reach the base tomorrow. It's hard to explore the North Pole in the summer because of the thin ice, so our mission was happening in the late winter. So besides extraordinarily low temperatures, we were surrounded by constant night. We set up two tents, one for John and I and the other for Gabe and Michael. After dinner in our tents, we prepared for sleep. Maybe an hour after falling asleep, John woke me up in a panic. Hey, wake up. There's something outside the tents, he whispered to me while shaking me. I quickly came to, pulling a gun from my nearby bag. What do you mean? What is it, John? Some animal? I asked. I don't really know for sure, but be ready, it sounds big. As the time passed, we heard it walking around the tents. I decided to take out the flashlight to better see what it was. As I turned it on, I quickly regretted my decision. By the noises we heard, we expected it to be a polar bear at worst. But the shadow I saw was nowhere near a polar bear. What John and I saw was standing on two legs and neared seven feet tall. I quickly turned off the flashlight. John and I began to pray under our breaths, hoping that it would not attack. We both had our guns ready. I felt a cold sweat developing on my forehead, my heart pounding like mad. I'd been on plenty of missions, but I had never seen anything like that. After maybe ten minutes, the sounds stopped. John and I quickly but quietly got out of the tent and entered Michael's and Gabe's. After we woke them up and explained what happened, they weren't too convinced by our story. It's just a polar bear. There's some of them around here, Michael said. I know what I saw, and we need to be careful, Michael, John replied. Arguing isn't going to help. We can rest for a couple more hours, but then we need to get to the base, I said. But I want you all to be extremely careful. Everyone quickly agreed. We rested for a few hours. It took us maybe two hours of a cold and hard walk through the snow and ice to make it to the military base. This base wasn't anything special. It was a medium-sized camp with two rooms for sleeping, a small kitchen, a small toilet, and the main room. When we arrived, we quickly turned on the generator to get the power and heat going. Then we started to unpack our gear. We had a lot of lab equipment, drills, gadgets, and computers. As we finished setting up, Michael notified our superiors via radio that we'd arrived. And after a quick meal of canned food, we decided to start work. Our first goal was to find a bigger crack in the ice surface, so we could go down it and take deeper pieces of ice for our study. Luckily, we found a crack about ten minutes away from the base. We set up two ropes to climb down. The whole thing wasn't that deep, but because it was dark, we couldn't see too well. Gabe and John were in charge of rope management, and Michael and I were sent down to take the samples. After a 20-foot descent, Michael and I reached a small platform. All right, Michael, you take eye samples from this platform and I'll try to reach the bottom. I told Michael as I headed down. As I reached the bottom, I noticed there was some kind of cave system. There were multiple holes around me. Place is bigger than I thought, I thought to myself. I quickly took my equipment and began to break the ice. It didn't take long for me to get this strange feeling that I was being watched. I began to constantly look around to see if I was safe, but one flashlight doesn't give you that much vision. As I began to finish up the job, I heard massive footsteps, and then I heard growling. I quickly looked in the direction of one of the cave entrances. I saw something. It wasn't a polar bear. It wasn't any other creature known to live in the North Pole. This was something different. It was huge, walking on two legs, covered in white fur. 
I could make out big red eyes and impossibly long teeth. I froze for a moment. I had no idea what to do. My mind tried to figure out what this thing was, but it came up empty. I stood there for a few moments just frozen, like everything else around me. It felt as if my heart was going to explode. I then decided to take a few steps back, signaling John and Gabe to pull me out of the crack. As I took one step backwards, the ice under me made a little cracking sound. In that moment, the creature began to run right at me. Then I started to scream, calling for John and Gabe to pull me out. I could tell they were probably confused, but they quickly did what I said. Luckily for me, Michael was already done with his part of the job, so all three of them were there to quickly pull me out as I barely escaped this thing. By the time I reached the platform where Michael and I had split up, it was gone. After the guys pulled me out, they started to ask what happened. Guys, give me, give me five minutes, man. I, I gotta catch my breath. I told them. After a moment, I swallowed hard. We're not alone here. I, I saw, to be honest, I don't know what I saw down there, but some kind of creature tried to attack me. I explained. What kind of creature? Gabe asked. As I described it to them, I could see their faces becoming more and more serious. They knew me. We'd worked together for a while. They knew I wasn't making things up. We're probably dealing with some kind of Yeti-like thing, Gabe said. John chimed in. Gabe, you always act like you know everything. Do you really think that's a Yeti? Or don't you think that idea's a bit stupid? Well, no matter what it is, we need to be careful. From now on, we'll always take our guns with us, understand? Michael said. We all agreed. Thankfully, we had all the samples we needed for the day, so we went back to the base. During dinner, we discussed our options. One thing was clear. Our mission had just begun. Even if we wanted to cancel it, it would be a while before help could come get us. And that would be very expensive, leading to very upset superiors. All right, then we'll do our jobs as quickly as possible and get the heck out of here, I said to the guys. The next few days were pretty stressful. We were always paranoid and afraid. We didn't know what to expect. I was always holding on to my gun just to feel extra safe. To our luck in those few days, all we saw were a few arctic foxes. One night, maybe a couple of weeks later, as we slept, we heard a loud banging on the main base door. We were all quickly awake, turning on the lights. What's going on? Michael said. It's that creature. I think it's back, I told him. We were all terrified. There's nothing we could really do. We just prayed that the doors would hold. All of a sudden, I felt a rush of adrenaline. Guys, come on. We need to support that door. We all rushed over, barricading the doors, pushing ourselves against it too. It felt as if that thing on the other side was about to get in. I don't remember ever being that scared before. I'd been in perilous situations before, but this was different. Eventually, the thing on the other side relented. It gave up, and we could finally let go of the doors. By then, we were all trembling. After the attack, or near attack, we further barricaded the door and decided to sleep in shifts, so there was always one person awake. The next morning, I said to Michael, Man, we have the radio. We can call for a helicopter and get out of here. I know, but we have a bit of a job left. Five days at most. We guard the doors, do the job, and we get out. Michael said, and I had to agree. One day after that, we were crossing over a little mountain near the base. The terrain was awful there so we needed to walk very carefully. Just as we reached the top, I missed a step and began to fall. But I didn't fall all the way. Even so, I managed to break my leg. You alright? John called out. 
I've been better, guys. I think my leg is broken, I said. We cancelled our plans for the day, going back to the base so we could take a closer look at my injury. Oh, that's pretty bad. We need to call for help. Worst case scenario, he dies from this. Gabe explained after looking at my leg. Michael quickly took out our radio, calling for an emergency helicopter. You see, the emergency helicopter is a lot smaller than the one in which we came. It couldn't hold our equipment and all four of us. After a quick chat, we decided that John would leave with me and that Gabe and Michael would stay here for a few more days to finish up the job. To be honest, I wasn't too sure about that deal. I didn't want to leave Gabe and Michael out here alone with that creature. The helicopter arrived the very next day, and as John and I were leaving, I told Michael and Gabe to be extremely careful. Will do. See you soon, they said to us. Yeah, see you soon, I called out. Little did I know then, that was the last I'd ever see of them. When the emergency helicopter made it to its destination, I was quickly sent to surgery. Turned out to be a broken femur. If I didn't come back, I'd probably have lost my leg. As I rested in the army hospital, I anxiously waited for Gabe and Michael to come back. Then the day arrived, the day I would remember for the rest of my life. I was eating some lunch, John was with me because he came to check up on me. Our boss entered the room with the most serious look on his face I'd ever seen. He closed the door, and in his hands he had some kind of file. Is everything alright, sir? Have Gabe and Michael come back? I asked. Gentlemen, I don't know how to say this to you. But Gabe and Michael, they're no longer with us. As our boss said that, I felt a cold sweat coming on. What? How? Are you sure? What happened? John began to ask, but our boss repeated. Gentlemen, I do not know what to say. He then handed us a file, explaining that when the pickup team arrived to pick up Michael and Gabe... They found the main doors beaten inwards, and the inside of the base was completely trashed. The file contained pictures that shocked me. The base, our equipment, our things, everything had been destroyed, and there was what appeared to be bloodstains. In one of these pictures, I saw something. On the floor next to a broken mess of things was a tuft of white fur. After recovering from my injury, I quickly left that job. A funeral was held for my friends, and people were asking us questions, but I didn't know what to tell them. I felt responsible for their deaths. If I hadn't been so clumsy, if I hadn't broken my leg, the four of us could have kept that thing at bay, or even killed it. But I had messed up and abandoned them. I have no idea what it was we saw, and I don't know why it wanted us dead. But of one thing I am certain, it is real, and it's still out there, somewhere in the North Pole. Little Ball of Fur From Double D The story I'm about to share happened quite a while back, but to this day, it's the strangest thing I've ever experienced. Back then, I worked for a company that was doing all sorts of field maintenance, from mowing public parks to clearing overgrown government land and cleaning private plots. At the time, this company had a contract with a big local factory, for which we had to maintain electrical posts. This meant that most of the time we were working in the middle of nowhere, since most of the posts were passing through a forest. That morning, just like every other, I loaded the company's dilapidated Land Rover Defender with saws, trimmers, and other necessary equipment. My colleague Marco accompanied me as we headed into the heart of the wilderness. I loved that particular job because there were no bosses breathing down our necks, and I really liked Marco. He was a cool guy, with whom you could talk about anything, from local gossip 
to secrets of the universe, and even astral projection. Marco and I had our own work strategy, which was, as soon as we arrive in the morning, we hit work hard and work like maniacs for several hours. Then we'd have an extra long lunch break, after which we would slowly finish the rest of the work and clean everything up. That day by 1 p.m., we'd done a fair amount of work and decided it was break time. We sat in the open back of the Defender, eating our food and discussing the day's subject. Our philosophical conversations were interrupted by the sound of a bell. Just as I was about to say, sounds like someone's cat. A cat indeed came out of the thick bushes surrounding us. What a cat it was too. A chubby black and white cat with a bright red collar with a small golden bell on it. Surprised, to say the least, we tried to figure out what such an animal was doing all the way out here. I know there are all kinds of messed up people, and that unfortunately, many of them do not hesitate to abandon their pets in secluded places. But Marco and I immediately agreed, this animal simply did not belong out here. First of all, it was fat, not at all scared or wild. On the contrary, it seemed very tame and friendly. Strangest of all, it was completely clean and dry, despite it being a dewy morning, and it had these extremely noticeable snow-white, perfectly clean paws. Secondly, as I said, I've seen many times people abandoning their pets, but this location just seemed an unlikely one to drop off a cat. I mean, it took us the better part of an hour on an almost non-existent road with a huge 4x4 vehicle. So, someone going through this much effort just to abandon a cat was just against all logic. And yet, there it was. When Marco tore off a piece of his sandwich and threw it on the ground, that's when weird things kicked off. The meowing cat slowly approached the piece of food Marco generously wanted to share. And as soon as its snout touched the bits of bread and salami, an inexplicable show began to unfold in front of our dumbfounded faces. Imagine a cheap battery-powered toy, then imagine that those batteries are almost dead. That is the best and closest description I can give you. Its meowing sounded like it was coming from very cheap speakers, not a living cat, and this animal was now twitching, repeating the same movements over and over again just like a toy struggling against a dead battery. The cat, if I can call it that, suddenly changed direction in a very robotic manner, all the while meowing like a toy, before disappearing into the bushes from which it came minutes ago. Due to the density of the bushes, it was quickly out of our sights, but we could clearly hear all the sounds it continued to make. Now it sounded like one of those old school radios, while you're trying to find a station, like white noise and crackling, with weird, unrelated, and random sentences in between in different voices and parts of songs and children's tunes. When we could no longer hear it, we just sat there in silence. I think neither of us could find the right words to say about this unreal, unexpected, and unearthly encounter. We spent the rest of the shift looking over our shoulders expecting this thing to come back, but it never did. Not that day, nor any other time we were there. I can't say we were afraid, but we were confused, and even shocked, without a doubt. Like, what even was that? A cat with rabies? An alien? A demon? Some kind of shapeshifter? A shared hallucination? To this day, I have no idea but there are some seriously weird things out there hiding in places where people don't often venture. Of that, I am certain. Illuminate from Shadow Dweller I work at a graveyard as a security officer. I've been at this job for the past five years. It's a rather large graveyard in western New York, and contains several thousand bodies, with new ones being added every day. I've seen it all out here. Junkies, drunkards, 
teens looking for places to party. Needless to say, there are stories of the paranormal with my coworkers, but I've personally never seen such things. This was my first graveyard shift of the year, so I had all my gear as well as extra batteries for the flashlight on my hip. I looked around my office for anything I could have missed, picking up the golf cart keys and a small bag of Halloween chocolates. My kid had snuck it into my lunchbox, so I happily munched on them throughout the evening. I went section by section, flashing my lights around the spots we usually find people, and it seemed like it would be a quiet night so far. I put the cart in neutral and listened for anyone and anything. I was currently in the oldest section, which was usually the most common spot. It was unusual not to even hear a rustle around me. Deer usually ran rampantly around the graveyard, several herds making the grounds their home. I fixed my hair, which had been whipped around by the wind on the drive. I then got out of the cart, making my usual path through fallen tombstones, older above ground graves, and beautiful stone angels. Honestly, I don't know what I expected, but it absolutely was not my radio bursting to life. It was my coworker in the World War II section coming over the radio. He sounded frantic. Seth, there's people, a person, I don't know, man. Copy that. Hang on, I'm around the corner. I'll join you soon. Keep non-lethal and we can meet up and find them. You got a description for me? He paused a second, seeming to be thinking. Uh, dark, fast, dude looked like a shadow, you know. Zay, my guy, are you trying to tell me you saw a ghost? I couldn't help but tease Xavier. I was really just trying to lighten things up. Oh man, I don't know. This is so messed up, though. I was doing a walk towards the back, and this thing just jumped out. I'd made it back to the cart by then and I made a quick dash towards the soldier's section. There was Xavier with his taser drawn, gawking around the dark, doing small circles, his eyes wide open. Zay, you take the back, I'll take the front. Keep your eyes open and radio me if you see anything. I got out, put a cartridge in my taser, and began to circle around the front of the few thousand stones. Now, he must have been freaking me out at least a little bit, because I saw movement in the older section and I jumped slightly. I put my flashlight steadily in the holster on my hip, angling it so I could see around me. I felt eyes intensely on me, and my skin began to crawl. WNY security, come out where I can see ya. As long as you leave now, we can go without an issue. There was no response, other than slight shuffling from the rows on the left. So I swung that way and began a slow-paced march, radioing Xavier. Hey, on me. I found him. Seth, I'm on my way. Two rows behind you. We met up in a few moments, and the rustling only got louder as we aimed our tasers, proceeding towards the noise. Come on out. You're trespassing at this hour. Suddenly, a shadow sprinted from the grave markers and took off full force down the row. The two of us gave chase, frustration building at how fast this figure seemed to be. After a sharp left, we lost sight amongst older and larger headstones. We did a sharp formation creeping between stones and all we heard or saw were several deer in the older sections. They stared at us before fleeing, and we'd reached the main road through the graveyard. Zay, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to end up claiming this was a deer. I wasn't sure what the heck it was. I'd never seen a person move so fast, but we definitely hadn't seen footsteps yet, or anything of a person. Look, man, I don't care what you slap on the paperwork, but we both know it was something else. Whatever, I'm sitting in the office and staring at the cameras. I gave him a nod not looking forward to the paperwork that would come out of this. But I sighed, watching Zay as he loaded up into his own cart. I'll be patrolling the children's section, then the newer. I'll call if I see anything, I told him. He patted my shoulder. Better you than me, bud. And he drove away. 
Personally, I don't know what led us around the graves that night. I really wanted to label it as a deer. We never saw a person or anyone else that evening. But come morning, I made sure that report said a deer had broken from the herd and led us around. But to be honest with you, I didn't and still don't believe it was a deer. Last I heard, deer don't run on two legs. Like Father, Like Son From Sandra Kirpin This may not be the scariest story, but it is completely true, and if you ask me, it is quite disturbing. The story doesn't include aliens, cryptids, or any creatures, but a family tragedy, which, although it happened long before I was born, is still often mentioned among my family members. It was the cold winter of 1940. John was my grandmother's older brother, and just like 80% of the male local population at the time, he worked in a coal mine. It was a job that he allegedly hated more than anything. And could you really blame him? Imagine crawling deep into the womb of the earth every single day, breathing in black, sticky dust, which creeps into every millimeter of your lungs and every pore of your skin carrying with you nothing else but courage, a pickaxe, and a headlamp that illuminated nothing more than a sad picture of a harsh reality. Unfortunately, John could not change his job, because A, it wasn't easy to find a job, as there weren't that many at the time, and B, like most folks back then, he was uneducated and only knew how to read and write. But perhaps the most important reason was that as a young boy, John had lost his father, and as the oldest male child, had to take on the burden of taking care of his family. What makes all of this even sadder is that his father was killed in an accident, doing the very same job which John was now doing to support his mother and siblings. Life really used to be hard and merciless back in the day. On that fateful day, John slept late in the afternoon like always whenever he worked night shifts and when his mother entered the room to wake him up, she found him already awake and upset. Hesitant at first, John told her about a dream he had. He dreamt that his late father came to wake him up and told him not to go to work because if he did, he would die. Although John was not easily frightened, this dream disturbed him a lot. It was so realistic that for a moment he thought that his father was really alive and with him in his room. His mom, who never got over the death of her husband, was terrified and told him to stay at home that night. She offered him a plate of warm soup, a sincere hug, and sent him back to bed. That night, a horrible accident really did happen in the mine. 185 miners lost their lives on the spot due to an explosion of coal dust caused by improper mine blasting, and another 90 died later on due to the effects of carbon monoxide inhalation. With the first rays of the weak winter sun, news of the accident reached the small sleepy town. The news went door to door, making new widows, leaving children without brothers and fathers. When John's mother heard what happened, she was shocked and happy at the same time. Shaken because she herself was a widow, and she knew what kind of sorrow and struggle awaited all those poor women, and happy because her beloved son miraculously escaped death. She ran into the bedroom to wake John up, to wrap her arms around him, then inform him about the sad fate of his colleagues. He had to know that he was right. But when she opened the door, her joy evaporated in a split second. Although he had stayed home just like his father told him in his dream, her son was now lying dead in a still warm bed. Above his bed, a huge painting with a massive heavy frame and thick glass, which fell during the night, had somehow crushed John's skull. What was on the painting, you ask? Well, no more and no less than a portrait of his late father. Sadly, it looked like that day was destined for him, because he wasn't getting out alive either way. 
what an awful way to go. And what's even more strange is that my grandmother, John's sister, kept that painting, and it's still somewhere in the attic of the house where she lived. It's always remained broken and damaged from that very day that had killed her big brother, the breadwinner of the family, whose death pushed them even deeper into the jaws of severe poverty. It was the only existing picture of her father, and she didn't want to forget his face. When I first found out about this story, I remember that I used to look at the gentle face behind the broken glass for hours, wondering if John really had dreamt of his dad that night, and if it was possible that his dad's spirit knew that it was the day that his little boy would die. So he wanted him to die in his sleep instead of being caught in some explosion, even though I don't know which is worse between the two. I only know that even after all these years, this story is just as sad and disturbing to me. I'm not overly religious, but I really hope that John is happy and in a better place, because his difficult, short life was anything but happy. Spirits vs. Marines From Pengu Winds I'd enlisted in the Marine Corps Reserve right out of high school, back during the height of the war in Iraq. Boot camp was grueling, but I eventually got through it and graduated. From there, I had to go to MOS training to learn my job. I went into the infantry and passed the assaultment course to be an 0351. This means I specialized in demolitions for urban operations, as well as using rocket launchers for anti-tank or anti-fortification operations. It was extremely fun getting to blow everything up, but those are stories for another time. Upon completing the course, I had to report to my unit to get my paperwork filed and figure out which platoon I'll report to on first drill weekend. My first drill was in September, and of course, being the new guy, I immediately screwed up. I told myself, come next month, I'll do better. When I arrived for October's drill, we were told we were bussing out to a new training ground recently acquired for military and police use. It was an old abandoned hospital and asylum the government was in the process of converting to a large training center. Just the place a bunch of rowdy marines would love to be at for Halloween. The first day we were there, we had an hour or two of free time in the afternoon. So being the inquisitive bunch, some guys from my platoon and I decided to explore the hospital building next door to our sleeping quarters, which was one of the asylum buildings, complete with pads on a lot of the room's walls. The hospital looked as if everyone had just vanished in a single day. Supplies and equipment were still in place in every room. It was unsettling from the stark contrast of dried leaves, twigs, and various debris in the halls, versus the clean organization of the rooms and offices. We all decided to scatter and explore on our own, some guys going up to the top floor, some going down to the basement, and a few stragglers like me just wandering the ground floor. After a while, we all collected together in the lobby. We were greeted by a sight we'll never forget. One of our corporals and another marine came back wearing full scrubs over their camis. I don't know where or how they found those, but they looked pristine. We all had a good laugh when another marine came back from the basement almost out of breath. He managed to blast out in a rushed tone. You guys gotta come see this. We all followed him down to the basement, down a series of hallways, Near the end of the building, he stopped and pointed to a sign. It was a dusty sign, but you could still easily read the printing. In large black letters, it read, Morgue. Everyone's eyes lit up, and we all rushed in, though I guess I was the most apprehensive about it. I've seen spirits and ghosts since I was a small child, and this just didn't seem right to me. Inside, it was a smallish concrete room, with one wall covered in those refrigeration trays for the bodies and large double doors on one side that led to the docking ramp for the ambulances. One of the guys pulled out a morgue tray, and we could all see the stains lining the edge of it. 
The reddish residue looked like blood, but could easily have been rust. For the sake of my own mind, I chose to think it was just rust. Surely the staff would have kept better care of the morgue than that. We all dared each other to lie in the tray and see who could stand to be locked in there for the longest time. I stood back and just watched. I could not bring myself to entertain such a morbid game. Soon we all left and returned to the platoon to see what they had for us next on the training schedule. Turns out, that night, we had a night raid to plan for. The scenario was this. Our company gunnery sergeant was acting the role of a high-value target. We received intel that the HVT was holed up in one of the buildings across the campus. We were tasked with raiding said building, snatching up the HVT, then expel back to the base while keeping an eye out for possible counterattacks. The plan was to set out just before midnight, so we would have the full cover of night to reach the target. This involved the whole platoon, so we wanted as much shadow cover as possible to mask our movements. We set out without issue, and after a bit, we made it to the target building. It was a medium-sized four-story office building. Every window was dark. There were absolutely no lights on in the entire structure, which added to the already tense atmosphere. One squad was left outside to set a cordon while everyone else rushed into the building. We quickly filtered in and cleared the first floor. No sign of Gunny here on this floor, so the plan was to clear the rest of the building one floor at a time going up. A few of us were left to guard the stairwells on each end of the building. I was put on the stairwell closest to our entry point with a couple of other marines. The rest of the platoon went up using the opposite stairs, and as soon as the last one went up, the oppressive silence entered. We could occasionally hear muffled shouts and bangs of doors opening and closing, but those sounded miles away. The crackle of our radio shattered the quiet so unexpectedly it made us all jump, and we heard our platoon sergeant saying, Second floor clear, heading up to third. We replied with a copy that, as did the other stairwell team. I thought it was quiet before, but now it was as silent as the grave. I swear I could hear my own heartbeat loud as a drum. The shifting of one's feet sounded like a bomb in the quiet night. Bang, 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 we heard the unmistakable sounds of boot steps down in the basement. Each step echoed from below like gunshots. We hopped on the radio and relayed that he may be in the basement. A fire team was detached and sent down to clear it. I could hear the confused shouts and shuffling feet of the marines in the basement. Sounded like they found nothing, and the radio soon crackled the life, telling us that exact thing. No sign of the high-value target at all down there. The fire team left the basement to rejoin the main force as they made their way up to the top floor. The now familiar silence set in once more as we resumed our vigil. All three of us were on edge from hearing those boot steps earlier. Then, bang, bang, bang. We all stared at each other with wide eyes. The boot steps were there again, and we knew there was no mistaking that for anything else. We radioed it in, and once again, a team was dispatched to inspect. And once again, they found no sign of the HVT at all. We were admonished for believing every little sound, but we stood firm on what we heard. The main force returned to the ground floor soon after. There was no sign of Gunny anywhere, so we decided to exfil and debrief the situation. During the debrief, First Sergeant filled us in that the intel was false and Gunny was never in that building. In fact, we were the only ones in the building. The two Marines I was on guard duty with looked at me and we all had the realization that we hadn't heard a person, or at least someone that wasn't a person anymore. The next day went without incident, but as we were waiting around for the buses to arrive, I heard the latest story working its way through the Lance Corporal underground. Apparently, when Company Command did the recon for the training scenarios, 
they had an incident of their own. They'd been in the same office building we'd raided, and upon entering, they had to turn the lights on to inspect everything. First Sergeant had been the last to leave each room, ensuring the lights were turned off. They did this on every floor going up, but found lights turned on in some of the rooms on the lower floors. First Sergeant said this creeped him out, because he knew he had turned off all the lights as they exited each room. That's the part that gave me chills. Our company first sergeant was an old, hardened marine who could stare hell in the eyes and giggle about it. The fact he was at all creeped out definitely had me scared. Tales from the Break Room is a viewer-submitted podcast featuring allegedly true scary stories that happened on the way to, on the way from, or at work. If you want your story to be narrated on the show, send it to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. As of April 14th, we're paying three cents per word for stories that are approved and make it onto the show. Submission does not guarantee approval or payment. For a limited time only, PayPal only. Tales from the Break Room is an EerieCast network original podcast hosted by Darkness Prevails. You can follow him on Twitter at Dark Prevails, and you can hear thousands more stories read by him on our other show, Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and rate Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can also enjoy plenty more horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com. <laughs>